So let's work through the chapters one and two accounting review. So what we're going to be doing in this review is taking a look at all of these transactions. We'll be talking about how to journalize these transactions, um, how to post into T accounts to figure out the balances of accounts, uh, preparing a trial balance, and then preparing our financial statements. Right, so chapters one and two are all about figuring out uh, how to journalize, what the normal balances of accounts are, and the steps that we need to take in order to make these financial statements. So we will start here with our list of transactions. All right, so we have a long list of transactions here for Artichokes LLC. So if we move on to the journal entries, and hopefully that's not too small for you in the upper right corner, uh, July 1st, it says that Artie invests $30,000 in the business of Artichokes LLC. So that's the owner putting money into the business. All right, so if we're thinking about the journal entry here on July 1st, we need to think about it from the perspective of the company, right? So the company, what is the company getting? Well, the company is getting cash here, right? Because the owner is investing money into the business. And what does the owner get in all of this? The owner gets a piece of the business, right? And we call that owner's capital. So our journal entry here will look like this. We're going to be debiting our cash and crediting our owner's capital. Now, cash is an asset account. So by debiting cash, we are increasing our cash account balance. And owner's capital increases with a credit. So we're increasing our owner's capital with this $30,000 credit. So then we move on to our next transaction. And it says that we signed an office space rental agreement and we paid $6,000 for six months. So we are paying in advance here for six months worth of rent. Um, so a few different things should, should pop up, right? We're thinking rent and when we're paying in advance like this, we call that prepaid rent. So prepaid rent is an asset account for whenever you pay for rent for more than one month in advance, right? So we're dealing with prepaid rent here. And then whenever you pay something, that means that cash is going to be involved. So here we paid $6,000. So we would need to show that our cash is decreasing. So the way that we're going to journalize this is we want to increase our prepaid rent account by debiting prepaid rent 6000 So since prepaid rent is an asset and assets go up with debits, we are showing here that prepaid rent is increasing by the $6,000 amount. And then how did we pay for this prepaid rent? by using cash. So cash is in is another asset, right? And cash goes down with a credit. So we credit our cash for 6,000. And you'll notice in these journal entries, we have at least one debit and at least one credit and the amounts equal, right? The total debits have to always equal the total credits for each individual journal entry. Now on July 3rd, you purchased $15,000 of equipment, you paid $5,000 in cash, and the remainder is on account. So we're buying some equipment here, right? We could think of this equipment as, let's say we're buying a bunch of computers for our new office. And so all of the computers together cost a total of 15000 
but we only put a $5,000 down payment on this purchase. And then the remainder on account means that we're just gonna pay the rest later. All right, so if we just think about the accounts that are being affected here. First, we are buying equipment, which means that our equipment account has to show that it's increasing because we now have more equipment in the company. Then it says that we paid $5,000 in cash, right? So we've already talked about this. If we are paying cash, we need to show that our cash is going down. And then the remainder on account means that we will be having to pay in the future that $10,000 leftover amount so whenever we owe people money, that will be accounts payable. So our journal entry will look like this. First, we're going to debit our equipment because equipment is an asset. And so we're increasing the amount of equipment that we have. And we debit our equipment for the full 15,000 because we wanna show that that's the amount of equipment that we got. Then we credit our cash for 5,000 to show that our cash has decreased by 5,000. And then we credit accounts payable by 10,000, right? Because we said that accounts payable was going to be used here because that's money that we owe this company that we bought the equipment from. And we get the 10,000 by taking the 15,000 cost for all the equipment minus the 5,000 down payment that we made. So here you'll notice we have multiple credits, right? The rule for journal entries is that we always list our debits first and then we list our credits. If you have multiple credits, you can list those in any order that you want as long as they come after the debits. Right, so if we wanted to flip around the cash and accounts payable here, that's okay. What's important is that equipment is listed first and then we list our two credit accounts. Now here on July 6th, we buy $500 of supplies on account. So we think, what are we buying? Well, we're buying supplies, and supplies are things like office supplies, so paper and pencil. Supplies is an asset. Our supplies account has to increase here because we are purchasing more, so we debit our supplies to make that account go up. Now, how did we pay for these supplies? Well, it tells us that we bought them on account. And when you buy something on account, that means that we will be paying for these supplies in the future. So it's going to affect our accounts payable. Right, so you'll see the phrase on account pop up in a few different ways. If we are the one purchasing something on account, that tells us that accounts payable will be affected. If a customer owes us something on account, right? If we perform services on account, then that's telling us that accounts receivable will be affected. So we just need to think about which side of the transaction we're on. Now on July 10th, we received $10,000 in payment from a customer for future services. So here we are getting money, right? We're getting $10,000. So we need to show that we're getting that money. So we debit our cash to make our cash account increase because cash is an asset and assets go up with debits. Now, why did we get this 10,000? Well, it tells us that it was from a customer for future services. So if we get paid before we do any of the work to earn it, that's something called unearned service revenue. 
So a few common examples of unearned service revenue will be something like uh, plane tickets, right? If we're for Southwest Airlines and we're selling plane tickets, we're getting that cash now for a flight two months from now, right? So that's unearned revenue. Um, another example will be gift cards, right? If a company sells you a gift card, you you haven't bought anything from them. They haven't really given you any goods or services yet. And so that's an unearned revenue. Now, an important thing to remember here is that unearned revenues are not revenue accounts. Unearned revenues are liability accounts because we are liable for those future services. So any questions so far? Um, again, you can always just unmute your microphone or put it over in the chat um, with any of these journal entries. All right, let's uh, move on then to the second half of these entries. So on July 12th, it says that Artie withdraws $1,000 cash for personal use. So remember, Artie was our owner here. So Artie is taking money out of the business for personal use. Whenever we see that, we need to be thinking of owner's drawings. So owner's drawings is whenever an owner takes money out for personal reasons. So Artie's taking cash out of the business. So owner's drawings goes up with a debit. Uh, so we will debit our owner's drawings here. Now what is Artie taking out? He's taking out cash. So our cash has to decrease because we need to show that the company, Artichokes LLC, has $1,000 less in cash now. Now on July 14th, we perform services worth $3,000 and we bill the customer for the amount. So here we are doing the work, but we aren't getting paid right away. Uh, the, the customer owes us this money in the future, right? So if they owe us this money in the future, we need to be thinking of the asset account, accounts receivable. So accounts receivable is whenever someone owes us money down the road, right? So if you bill a customer, they owe you that money, so our accounts receivable is increasing here by 3,000. And now why do they owe us this money? Well, because we performed services for them. So whenever you perform services, whenever you do the work, whenever you make the sale, we always need to count the revenue, All right? So we will count the revenue here on the 14th by crediting our service revenue account for that 3,000. So even though we haven't gotten paid yet for this work, uh, we still wanna show that we've done the work, we've earned the revenue, and our customers owe us some money. So that's what's happening in that journal entry. Now on July 18th, we paid employees a total of $2,000. So we need to think about what our, uh, what our accounts are going to be in this entry, right? So we are paying our employees uh, for the work that they've done. Well, whenever we pay someone, we know that cash has to decrease, right? So we can be thinking right now, okay, cash is gonna be our credit account because we need to decrease the amount of cash that we have. But why is our cash going down? Well, because we have to pay our employees. And so whenever you pay your employees, you need to show that the expense happened, right? We wanna count this salaries expense or 
you might see it as salaries and wages expense. We need to show that that expense happened here. So we will debit our expense account to increase our expenses. And then we credit our cash account to show that our cash is decreasing. Now on July 21st, we receive payment in full from the customer that we billed back on the 14th. Right, so back on July 14th, we billed our customers $3,000. Here on the 21st, they are now paying us back. So what are we getting as the company? We are receiving payment, which means that we're getting cash. Right, we are getting cash, so we want to increase our cash by that 3000 So we debit our cash to make that account go up. And then we need to think about what other accounts might be affected here. Oh, we want to make sure that we don't only record that we got the payment, but we also want to show that our customers don't owe us this money anymore. Right, because on our books, we, we have that customers owe us $3,000. But now, they paid us back, so they don't owe that. So we need to decrease our accounts receivable by crediting that asset account by that 3000 So in this entry, we're not only showing that our cash is increasing, but we also need to show that the customers that paid us don't owe us anything anymore. And now you'll notice we did not affect our revenue account again here because we didn't earn any more money. We didn't do any more work to earn more revenue. All that happened was people that owed us paid us. And so we need to show that our cash is going up and our accounts receivable is going down. Now on July 28th, we pay creditors $2,000 for amount owed. So a creditor is a fancy word for someone that you owe money to. All right, so we owed people money, and now we need to show that we paid some of it back. Right, so whenever you owe someone money, we need to be thinking of the account, accounts payable, right? So our accounts payable will be affected, and then the other account that's going to be affected here is going to be our cash, because we are paying our creditors this $2,000. So we want to decrease our accounts payable, and accounts payable is a liability account. So to decrease a liability, we debit that liability account. Then we need to show how we decreased accounts payable. Well, we decreased it by actually paying these people. So we also want to decrease our cash by that 2000 So we debit accounts payable to decrease that account, and then we credit cash to decrease that account as well. So one more entry here. It's another compound entry. So we have more than two accounts affected here. It says that on July 30th, we performed services for a customer. We earned $12,000 in revenue, received $8,000 in cash, and the remainder is on account. So there's a few different pieces that we can break apart there. The first is perform services. When you see those words, we need to be thinking revenue, right? And then they even tossed in there, uh, for good measure, that you earned $12,000 in revenue. So we can even write down right now, okay, service revenue, $12,000, right? Because that's the amount that we earned. Then you received $8,000 in cash. 
So you did work that was worth 12,000 and customers paid you 8,000. So our service revenue had to increase since we earned the revenue. Our cash is increasing since we are receiving cash. And then it says the remainder is on account. So we can think, okay, do we owe people money here or do people owe us money? Well, if you did $12,000 of work, got paid $8,000, that means that customers still owe you $4,000, right? The difference between the 12 and the eight. So how are we gonna journalize this? We first show that our cash is increasing. Right, so to increase cash, we debit that account. And we debit it for the 8,000, the amount of cash that we received. After that, we show that our accounts receivable is being affected for 4,000, that it's increasing for that $4,000 amount. Because customers owed you $4,000 more. And then why did they pay you 8,000? Why do they owe you 4,000? It's because you perform services. So we wanna count our service revenue of 12,000. So again, we list our debits first and then our credits. If we wanted to flip our cash and accounts receivable accounts in that last journal entry, that's okay. What is important is that we list those before we list our service revenue. And again, your total debits have to equal your total credits. So 8,000 plus 4,000 is 12,000, which is the amount that we credited service revenue for. So we have all of these journal entries, and if I were to ask you the balance in cash, my guess is that it's going to take a while for you to figure that out, right? So what we do is after we journalize entries, we can then use a few different methods to figure out the balance in each account. Uh, we, we could use a ledger. Uh, but we can also use something called a T account. So if we make a T account here for cash and we go through um, all of our entries and we figure out what the balance is in cash after all of these entries, we can then use that to prepare a trial balance, which we then can use to prepare our financial statements. So let's talk about the process here of using a T account. So if we start on the very first entry, we see that cash is affected. Cash is going to be affected by a debit of 30,000. So we put that over on the debit side of our T account. So the left side of your T account are debits, the right side are credits. Then we move on to the next entry and we see that cash is credited 6,000. So we pop that 6,000 over on the credit side of our T account. All right, so we're just gonna go entry by entry and see what happened to cash and uh, show that change over in our T account. After that credit of 6,000, we see on July 3rd, we credited cash for 5,000. So we can put that into our T account. On July 6th, nothing happened to cash, right? That was just supplies and accounts payable. So we don't have to worry about um, posting anything to our cash T account on that day. That would only affect our supplies and our accounts payable T accounts. 
Now here on July 10th, we debited cash for 10,000. So we'll put the 10,000 over on the debit side. On the 12th, we see that we credited cash for 1,000. On the 14th, there was no cash involved. So we can skip over that one for right now. On the 18th, we credit cash for 2000 On the 21st, we debited cash for 3000 On the 28th, we credited cash for 2000 once again. And then in our final entry, we debited cash for 8000 Now, we can now see all in one spot all of our debits and all of our credits to cash, right? But this still doesn't just give us the balance. So what we will need to do is we will need to figure out our balance in cash using these amounts. Um, a few different ways that we can do it. We can add up our debits and add up our credits and then just subtract the difference and put the balance on the side that had more. Another way to do it is we think about the normal balance in cash. Cash has a normal debit balance, which means that those four debits that we have, those are all increasing our cash account. So it's a positive 30,000, a positive 10,000. And all of our credits, well, cash decreases with a credit. So all of those credits are decreases to your cash balance. So a negative 6,000, a negative 5,000, a negative 1,000. So if we work on this, I'm going to give you guys a minute or so to uh, figure out what the balance in cash is going to be based off of this T account. So we can see that the balance is 35,000. Right, so we just add up our debits and subtract all of our credits. Now, what's important here is that we also clearly show that the balance is over on the debit side, right? Because it's a debit balance in cash. And again, we know that based off of the fact that our debits had more than our credits and that cash has a normal debit balance. So, are there any questions right now about T accounts and how we figured all of this out? Can you just go through the point of clarification and say whether you're adding or subtracting? Yeah, so, uh, so going through each, each uh, transaction and figuring out whether it's an addition or subtraction. So here on July 1st, when we debited cash of 30000 we are increasing our cash because it is a debit and debits increase our cash account. Our second entry on July 1st, we credit cash of 6,000 because we are paying for that prepaid rent. Would you be um, increasing or decreasing the same as before? When, when we pay for the rent, that's gonna decrease the cash that we have. Uh, because we have to pay for that six months worth of rent. On the on July 3rd, that's a decrease to our cash because we are paying for that equipment, right? So when we credit cash, that's going to be a decrease in that account's balance. Um, on July 10th, we debit cash because we received money. And when we debit cash, that increases the balance in our cash account. On July 12th, uh, Artie took money out of the business, so we credited cash to decrease our account, our cash balance. On the 18th, we paid for our employees' salaries, so we credited cash to decrease the amount of cash that we had. On the 21st, we 
received payment from some of our customers. So we debited cash to increase the amount of cash that we had. On the 28th, we credited cash uh, because we had to pay back some people that we owed. So that decreased the amount of cash that we had in our business. And then on the 30th, we received cash. So we debited cash to increase our, uh, our cash balance. So we have a long list of accounts here, right? We have accounts receivable, supplies, prepaid rent, equipment. Um, I'm going to give you guys a little bit to write down all of these account names. And then we will go back and look at all of our, um, all of our journal entries and you can work through and figure out all of the balances in these accounts. So we have accounts receivable, supplies, prepaid rent, equipment, accounts payable, unearned service revenue, owner's capital, service revenue, and salaries expense. So basing off of what we did with cash, I want you guys to figure out the balances for each of these accounts. And I'll give you, I'll give you a few minutes here um, as we figure out these balances. Here's all of our accounts, right? And when we take a look at all of these balances that we found using those T accounts, we now know what we have in each of these accounts, right? Rather than taking a look at all those journal entries and trying to figure it out, we can just look at T accounts, figure out the balance for each individual account and then we have them all here. Now once we do that the best step to then do would be to prepare a trial balance uh, because a trial balance is going to make it a lot easier on us when we want to prepare financial statements. Right? Rather than looking at all of our T accounts, which might be on separate pages, or looking at a ledger that is like a book, we can just put this all on one trial balance, on one sheet of paper, and look at all of our accounts and their balances. So a few different steps to preparing a trial balance. First, we need to make sure that we list out all of the accounts in the correct order. The order that we're going to follow here is the expanded accounting equation. So it's going to be your assets, then your liabilities, then owner's capital, owner's drawings, revenues, and then expenses. So that's the order that we're going to list them out in. And our assets have to be listed out in a certain order as well. That's going to be the order of liquidity. So that's how quickly we can either turn it into cash or how quickly we expect to use up that asset. Then we also have these debit and credit columns, right? So that's where the balances for each account will go. Uh, and so if it's a debit balance, we put it under the debit column. If it's a credit balance, we put it under the credit column. Now, how do we know if it's a debit or credit? Well, we can look back at our T accounts, right? Whichever side the balance is on, that tells us. Or we think about our normal balances. So assets, drawings, and expenses will all have debit balances. Liabilities, owner's capital, and revenues will all have credit balances. 
So once we have all of the accounts and all of their balances here, we will then add up our debits and add up our credits to show that they equal. So let's get started with this trial balance, right? We want to list our assets first and we want to list them in order of liquidity. So how quickly we can turn it into cash. Well, cash is going to be first, right? Because we can turn cash into cash instantly. So we list our balance of 35,000 for cash in the debit column because assets have a normal debit balance. After cash, accounts receivable is next because accounts receivable is what we expect to collect from our customers within about 30 days, right? So that's going to be turned to cash pretty quickly. And we said that that balance was 4,000. That goes on the debit side. Then supplies. We had a $500 balance in supplies. Then prepaid rent. We had 6,000 in prepaid rent. And then we finally had our equipment of 15,000. So we have all of our assets listed out there. And again, all of your assets have normal debit balances, so they all go over in that debit column. After you list out your assets, then you list out your liabilities. So we had two liabilities here. We had accounts payable and we had unearned service revenue. So our accounts payable, that was an $8,500 credit balance. Right, because liabilities have a normal credit balance, so we put that over on the credit side. Then we have unearned service revenue. We said that that was 10000 so that goes over on the credit side. After our liabilities, then we're looking at the owner's equity portion of our accounting equation, right? So that's your capital, drawings, revenues, and expenses. So capital has a credit balance of 30,000. Drawings had a debit balance of 1,000. Revenue, our service revenue account, had a credit balance of 15,000. And salaries expense had a debit balance of 2,000. So you might have multiple revenue accounts um, chances are you will have multiple expense accounts. Uh, we just didn't have that in this example. So all of those expenses would be listed. All of those revenues would be listed together. Um, now we have all of our accounts. We have their balances. And then that last step was to add together the debits and add together the credits. Right. So if you add up your debit and credit columns, what are you guys getting for total debits and total credits? So your total debit needs to equal your total credits, right? And if we think back to the journal entries, that was a rule that we had back then too. And so as long as you journalize your transactions properly and you calculate your balances properly in a ledger or T accounts, and then as long as you don't you know, mess up a few numbers here, like instead of putting 35,000 for cash, you might put 53,000, right? So as long as we don't make those kinds of mistakes, your debits and credits will equal. Now, if they equal, we can move on to financial statements. If they don't equal, that's when you need to go back and figure out where the mistake happened. And if that's happening on an exam, I want your first step to just be add up your debits and add up your credits again. Make sure that you didn't make just some silly mistake in your calculator. If that doesn't fix it, we might have to go back to our T accounts or our ledgers. We might have to go back to our journal entries, right? But just make sure that it wasn't just a simple mistake of plugging numbers in incorrectly into your calculator. So we have our trial balance. Now we can start thinking about 
financial statements. So there's four financial statements that you need to know, right? There's your income statement, your owner's equity statement, your balance sheet, and your statement of cash flows. You need to know that all four exist, but you, you won't need to make a statement of cash flows in your exam. You just need to possibly know that it, it even exists out there. So the three that you will need to prepare are an income statement, owner's equity statement, and a balance sheet. And we prepare them in that specific order. So the first one that we're going to prepare is an income statement. Now you'll notice this is an income statement for the month ended July 31st, 2020. So an income statement is going to be for a period of time. Um, it's not going to be a specific date. It could be for the month, for the year, for the quarter. It's always going to be for a period of time because these are your revenues and your expenses that happened over a period of time. So the first thing that we're going to list out are our revenues. And we had one revenue account. Um, so we list out our service revenue. Right? That was our one revenue account that we had. If we had multiple revenues, then we would have to deal with that. And we would list out our multiple revenues here. And then we would also show our total revenues by adding those up. Then we have our expenses. Well, we only have one expense here. All right, we just had that salaries expense of 2000 If we had multiple expenses, we would list those out, uh, greatest to least, and then we would show our total expenses as well. Now, we are preparing this income statement for one main purpose, and that's so that way, that way we can find our net income. So your net income is going to be your revenues minus your expenses. So we take our $15,000 in revenue minus our $2,000 in expenses, and we see that our net income should be $13,000. So once you prepare your income statement, you have your net income. And we're going to use that net income on our owner's equity statement. So that's why we, that's why we need to prepare these in a certain order, uh, because they build off of each other. So we have our net income here of $13,000. We'll keep that in mind while we prepare our owner's equity statement. So you'll notice at the top, it looks somewhat similar to the income statement, right? It's the company name, the name of the statement, and then once again, we're dealing with for the month ended. So an owner's equity statement along with an income statement are for periods of time. So this will be the changes in owner's equity over the month of July. So we want for the month ended July 31st, 2020. So an owner's equity statement is going to follow a certain framework every time. At the very beginning, we're going to list out our beginning owner's capital. So in this case, what's our owner's capital at the start of the month? Then we list out the pieces that will add to your owner's capital. And then we list out the pieces that subtract from your owner's equity. And then we list at the very bottom our ending owner's capital amount. So what was the owner's capital on July 31st? So let's start off with beginning owner's capital or owner's capital on July 1st. And you'll see that it's zero. And there's a reason why it's zero here because it's not always going to be zero. But if we think back to all of those transactions that we journalized at the start, 
it said that Artichokes LLC just started business on July 1st. So there was an investment on July 1st, but we are thinking of this owner's capital on this very first line as 12.01 a.m. on July 1st, right? Artie hasn't made that investment yet. So we didn't have anything in the business at 12.01 a.m. on July 1st. So whenever a company just starts business, it's going to start off with a zero. Then we think about, okay, what are we gonna add? Well, there's two different things that you can add on an owner's equity statement. You can add investments and you can add net income. And in this case, we had both. We had that $30,000 investment that we journalized back at the very beginning. And then we also had that $13,000 net income that we just found on our income statement. So we're gonna list those in the middle and then we need to add them together and we'll put that 43,000 over on the far right. Then after this add section, what we do is we take our beginning owner's capital and we add the 43,000. So in this case, you're gonna just see 43,000 written down there again. But know that we aren't just taking that 43,000 from above the line and putting it below the line. What we're doing is we're taking zero plus 43,000. So if you ever have a beginning owner's capital, that's gonna be added in to your investment plus net income amount. So after the add section, we have the less section. And there's two things that we can subtract on an owner's equity statement. We can subtract owner's drawings and we can subtract net loss. Now you'll either have a net income or a net loss, All right? So here we had a net income because our revenues were greater than our expenses. So we won't have a net loss in this problem, but we do have $1,000 worth of, of drawings. If we look back at all of our T accounts that we made, that was the balance in our owner's drawings account. So we take the 43,000 and now we subtract out the 1,000 in drawings and we can see that our owner's capital on July 31st is 42,000. So if you were to make an owner's equity statement for August, your owner's capital on August 1st would be 42,000 because it just carries over to the next day. Now, we made an income statement so then that way we knew our net income or net loss for our owner's equity statement. Then we made an owner's equity statement. So then that way we knew our owner's capital balance because we're gonna need that 42,000 on our balance sheet. So let's prepare a balance sheet now. And you'll notice a change up at the top. It's no longer for the month ended, July 31st. It's now just July 31st. A balance sheet is going to be a snapshot in time, saying on July 31st, these were the balances. Your last two financial statements, those were taking into consideration what has happened over the course of the month. Here, it's just on this date, these were the balances. Now, a balance sheet's going to be set up in a way that, that mirrors your accounting equation. So assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity, right? So in the first half of a balance sheet, we list out all of our assets. 
And then in the second half, we list out our liabilities and owner's equity. So let's get started here with our assets. Now, the good news is we already have that trial balance that we made, right? So we've already listed out all of our accounts, listed out their balances. We also already listed out our assets in order of liquidity. And you will want to show your assets on a balance sheet in the order of liquidity. So the first one, we're going to list out our cash, right? Because cash is already cash, so it's the most liquid. After cash is our accounts receivable, then our supplies, then prepaid rent, and then equipment. Right, so we have all of our assets listed out in order of liquidity here. That's going to be an order that, that you'll learn over time with more practice, uh, but I would recommend really studying your order of liquidity. Now, we, we don't just want to list out our assets and then move on to the next section. We want to show our total amount of assets because our balance sheet's going to prove that your total assets equals your total liabilities plus owner's equity. So we add up our five assets there. And when we do that, we see that our total assets will be $60,500. Now, once we have those all listed out, we can move on to the next section, our liabilities and owner's equity, or the right half of that accounting equation. So we're going to want to show that we're going to list out our liabilities first. We take a look back at our trial balance, and we see that we had two liabilities. We had accounts payable, and we had unearned service revenue. Now, you have two liabilities here, so you need to total those up as well. So if we add up the 8,500 and the 10,000, we see that our total liabilities is 18,500. Then we want to list out owner's equity accounts. So on a balance sheet, we won't be showing owner's drawings, we won't be showing revenues, we won't be showing expenses. And you'll learn more about why in chapter four. Right now, think of it as you're just taking the capital amount that you just calculated on your owner's equity statement. So you found that to be 42,000. So we'll list out owner's capital to be 42,000. So we want to add together now our liabilities and our equity. And we see that our total liabilities and owner's equity is 60,500. It's important here to notice your assets equals your liabilities and owner's equity. And that's going to happen every time, right? Because if we think about our accounting equation. So we need to make sure that when you add up your assets, that your total assets equals the same amount there as your total liabilities and owner's equity.